Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Unto thy name we give glory because of thy faithful love and truth towards us. Only in thee, loving Father, can we place our trust and our reliance because only in thee is our defence and our shield and our help. And for all people everywhere, both now and as it has been since thy creation, for those who give thee our trust, thou hast, and thou will bless those who fear and love thee, both small and great. Unto thee today, loving Father, we appeal for thy grace, because even although we are insignificant creatures, destined only to descend into silence. Thou, O Yahweh, hast made us significant in thy sight and provided us a hope. Even though we encounter and we witness trouble and sorrow swallowing the earth, when we call upon thee, thy graciousness and righteousness and compassion will envelope us and keep our eye from tears and our feet from stumbling. Our confidence is in thee, O Yahweh, to loosen our bonds, to call upon thee and thee alone in confidence, to fulfil our vows to thee and partake of the cup of salvation in thy presence in Jerusalem. It is with this confidence that we lay ourselves bare before thee this morning to remember and to acknowledge thy faithfulness towards us in providing the sacrifice of thine own son to give us life. Allow us to use thy son this morning, loving Father, to discern and divide our thoughts and the intents of our hearts and to call upon thee and thee alone to be our guide our shield and our defence against those who have no strength against thee. We seek thy blessing on our proceedings this morning, offering our praises in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning, brethren and sisters, has been prepared for us by Brother Tim Wilson, and he will read for us from Joel chapter 2, verses 18 to 32. Reading with you, brethren and sisters, from the word of our God, uh, Joel chapter 2. And commencing at verse 18. Then will Yahweh be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, Yahweh will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savour shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for Yahweh will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, 
and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As Yahweh hath said, and in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. We'll now sing hymn 246.
Now I ask Brother John to come forward and to lead us in a word of exhortation on the theme, then everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. Morning, brethren and sisters. Um, I'm just going to turn, you might like to, to Luke 24, where we'll start. It's really nice to get my mask off. I'm sorry to say that to you. Lovely fresh air. It doesn't fog up your glasses. And I noticed this morning, as complaining to Lynn, I have to put on my hearing aids, which clip behind my ear, followed by my spectacles, which clip behind my ear, for now followed by my mask, which clips behind my ear. And uh, two weeks ago, I got to the meeting and couldn't find my right hearing aid. We looked everywhere. And uh, on the way home, I thought, I just hope it's at home, you know. And when we got into the driveway, just before Lynn turned in, I said, stop. What do you mean? I don't go any further. And I got out of the car and I checked the driveway and I walked down the road in front of the driveway. And there it was. Not in the middle of the road, halfway between the mill and centre. All day, cars had driven over that, over the, left it untouched. $2,000 worth. So it was a happy ending to that memorial meeting. You know, it's good to be with everyone this morning, even though we're fewer number. It matters not. Everyone's enjoying a, a long weekend away, wherever they can go. And those that are listening on me say hello too. In fact, the last um, day, I've never got so many SMSs as, I have a, as I've got in the last 24 hours of brothers and sisters saying, I'm sorry, we can't be there. Though it was, it's very nice of them to do that, but they didn't need to, to bother. And it's nice to get a few SMSs for a change. Um, okay, so we're just going to start at Luke 24, which is just one of those lovely stories um, and such um, full of lovely lessons and that's the story of um, Cleopas, the two disciples who were leaving Jerusalem. They're walking on the way to Emmaus. It's in Luke 24, verse uh, 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs or 11 kilometres. So they, um, they had experienced, as many of the disciples had, a morning uh, the, the morning of, and the day of the Lord's resurrection. And a lot of things happened for those disciples, such as these two here. They're walking to Emmaus. One of them was named Cleopas. We don't know who the other was. I'd like to think, and I hope you forgive me for saying this, I'd like to think it was Cleopas's wife. And they were walking to Emmaus, we don't know what for, whether they lived there. I doubt it. it was a long way to go. Anyway, that's where they're going. And they were, as they were walking, they were questioning and reasoning about the events of the last three days in Jerusalem. And who wouldn't, particularly if you'd been so closely associated with the Lord as they had been. And then Jesus comes along. Yes, Jesus comes along and he joins them. He walks a little way, and obviously he listened a little bit to what they were saying. And then he says to them, what are you discussing? What's this talk about? What's happened? And in verse 18, Cleopas, just paraphrasing this, Cleopas, however you say it, replies, he said, you know, you, you, you must have been a visitor to Jerusalem in the last few days. Haven't you heard of the events that have happened? during this time. And then Jesus asks, he says, well, what things? What are you talking about? And they replied and they said, well, the things that have happened concerning Jesus of Nazareth. This, this man was a prophet. He was mighty in word and, and mighty in deed. And he did all these things before God and, and all the people. And I noticed there it doesn't say anything about the priests. And then in verse 21, he, they explained to the Lord how that they had trusted that this was the one who would redeem, had redeemed Israel. And then they go on in verse 23 and they say that some of our number went to look for his body. Well, of course, that's the incident about visiting the tomb. 
and they didn't see him there, but they allegedly were told that they saw some angels who spoke to them, telling them that he was alive. And then in verse 25, the Lord says to them, I'm going to read the English Standard Version. It's just slightly different. The Lord says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then in verse 27, he says, it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And the record goes on. We haven't got time to consider it, but the Cleopas and his wife returned back to Jerusalem after arriving at Emmaus. And they, when they got there, um, sorry, when, when the Lord had departed from them, they said to each other, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Brothers and sisters, I'm sure you can imagine that just must have been the most amazing experience and exposition on the scriptures anyone's ever heard, listening to his exposition. Must have been incredible. And I'm sure we would have been the same. We would have, if you ever heard a stirring talk where your heart burns, you get this deep inner feeling that's majestic, that's truthful, that is so awesome. I can't find any better words to say it. Well, this is one of those occasions. And later on that day, because it must have been a very busy day, it could have crept into the next day. And as you know, their, their day started in the evening. It could have been around 6 or 7 o'clock the next morning. Um, they visit the apostles and the disciples at Jerusalem. And there's quite a big crowd there. And then the Lord appears to them as well. And we read again in, in verse 44. This is what he says to them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you. Note this, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. We want to note, take note of those words concerning me. Let's just consider those words in the light of what's happened to us in the last 10 days or so. We've witnessed amazing things, perhaps frightening things, fearful things. I know at times like this, we brethren love talking about tanks and grenades and planes, and bombs at war. I think we ought to be a bit, bit careful at times, not just with ourselves, but particularly with our our sister wives and the sisters in general. We should never glory in war, as Brother Neil has, has already mentioned to us. And what have we seen? We've seen the commencement of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm not going to go into any details. We've also this week heard an historic announcer, announcement by the Chancellor of Germany, Mr. Olaf Scholz, to the German parliament, the Bundestag, and he announced what has been described by the, the learned um, um, reporters as a U-turn in the foreign affairs of Germany. Since the end of the Second World War, Germany has ne never concentrated on building up their armaments. But Mr. Schultz advised that's all going to change. They've changed their defence strategy. And this year alone, they're going to be spending 100 billion euros on defence. I don't, don't really understand what that means. I'm not very good at figures when it comes to war, but I'm told that's a lot of money. And that alone is a huge change. And it'd be something for us to think about in current events talks, what, what that means and what that means to Russia particularly. And maybe like me over the last week or so, 
although we've been talking about these things in prophecy for many years, to see it happen and starting to happen is a different thing, isn't it? And it really touches us deeply as we try to make sense of it all. And uh, Lynn and I have been pulling out a few books. One of them's Elp is Israel and a few other books by Dr. Thomas in particular over the last week. But I won't go into it now. What we've found, we've probably all read those things, hopefully, over the last few days. So let's take one of those examples where the Lord said all things must be fulfilled in the law of Moses and in the prophets. I'd like to take an example, first of all, from Leviticus chapter 23, if you'd like to turn there. And as you're doing so, you would have received a handout. Um, the first is an overall map of the feasts of Israel, just for your interest. And the other one is um, a blow up of the first three months of the religious calendar, which I did several years ago, and I've made a few slight changes to it. It's just for your interest. I'm not asking that you look at it during the exhortation. You might like to. You might, might like to make some notes on the back. But um, it's something that, that I find very interesting and just thought I'd share it with you. So we're looking at what the law says in regard to the feast of Yahweh. And in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 10, I'm going to read verses 10 through to verse 12. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I will give you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf. Imagine a sheaf of wheat or barley gathered together, and it's waved it's in motion before God. And it will be accepted for you. And note this on the morrow after the Sabbath that we, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you, uh, when you wave the sheaf, a lamb without blemish, and of the first year for a burnt offering under, unto Yahweh. So in verse 11, they were to take this sheaf of barley because the barley harvest or first fruits came first, as we know. And this was the first month, month of Abib. And it was waved on the day after the Sabbath. And as we say, just imagine the priest waving this sheaf because waving suggests life, all right? And so, and that was, that was the day after the Sabbath, so it was on the Sunday. And so when we go forward, we find the Lord Jesus Christ, he died on the, I believe, on the Thursday evening, p.m. Then there was the high Sabbath, the Friday, followed by the Sabbath, the Saturday in our language, and then the resurrection on the Sunday, the first day of the week. And that resurrection on the first day of the week, as we're told here, signified the waving of the sheaf of barley of the first fruits of the grain harvest, which points forward to Christ, our Christ the first fruits, as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. I know it's rather a mouthful, but that was fulfilled. That section of scripture, Leviticus 23, was fulfilled as it was signifying the death and the resurrection of the Son of God, so many years hence. When we come to verse 15, we read this. And you shall count unto you from the morrow, that is the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, so the day after the last Sabbath, which was a Sunday, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meal offering unto Yahweh. So they were to count from the morrow after the Sabbath, or the Sunday, or the first day of the week, however you like to describe it. And from the day that you bought the wave sheaf, that is the Sunday, you are to count seven Sabbaths, which is 49 days, right? And then verse 16, that's telling us when to stop counting. The day after the seventh Sabbath, the 49th day, that is 49 days plus one the next day equals 50 days. Very precise. And this was the day of Pentecost. 
It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. And it started on us and it was on a Sunday or the first day of the week, which means a new beginning. Now you'll see that on the handout. Um, you look at it now, or if you're like me, you'll need to go open it up with Leviticus 23 in front of you and, and have a think about it. If you disagree or find an error there, please let me know. Um, so we find just in this example that the law of Moses is like a prophecy, isn't it? Like a prophecy waiting to be fulfilled. It's a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, showing how he was going to be raised on the first day of the week, symbolised by the waving of that action in life of that sheaf. Forty days later, doesn't say it here, but we know that he was with, the Lord was with them for 40 days, he ascended. And 50 days later was <clears throat> the, the Holy Spirit gifts were given at the Feast of Pentecost. And that was still in the year AD 3, 33, the year of the Lord's death. And note this, it was in the third month, the month of Savan. So we come to the day of Pentecost. If you'd like to turn to Acts, uh, Acts chapter 1 and 2, we'll just might dive into Acts chapter 1 on the way. Acts chapter uh, 1. No, I don't think I'll read the verses, but you know that we're told there that the Lord, before he ascended, had commanded the apostles to wait in Jerusalem for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. In fact, it was 10 days hence when he said that. And after this, he ascended. And when we come to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, we read, we read there something quite remarkable. It says, and when the day of Pentecost, so those 50 days counted from the day after the, 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 the day after the Lord had risen, sorry, the day after the Sabbath, when the sheaf was waved, so that was the day of the Lord's resurrection, the day of Pentecost had finally come. But it doesn't say that in Acts. It says, oh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. In other words, here was the fulfilment here was the fulfilment of that which was predicted 17, 1800 years earlier in the law of Moses. When the feast of Pente day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. It wasn't just the apostles, it was the disciples and many people that were gathered on that occasion. And in Acts records for us in 2, verse 2, and suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire and it sat upon each of them. Just try to imagine that, how it must have been in that room. Something clearly of divine proportions, something that had never happened or been heard of, just the sound of that mighty rushing wind must have been an incredible experience. So it records there the, the sounds and the pictures of the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles, which would have been witnessed by all the Jewish and Gentile Christians alike that were there, some from Judea, some from Jerusalem, and some from abroad, from the diaspora. They all heard the apostles speaking in their own language and they knew they weren't learned people they knew they didn't have any linguistic ability like me I can't speak any other language than English my mother used to say you speak two languages good and bad but it's still English they clearly couldn't and they were amazed to hear them speaking in their own native tongue it was clearly a miracle of God and then verse in verse 12 and 13, we read, uh, and they were all amazed, verse 12, and were in doubt, saying one to another, what, what meaneth this? Others were mocking, and they say, these men, these apostles are drunk. They're full of wine. 
And verse 16, Peter then gives them an explanation and he stands up and he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Verse 17, and he says, and it shall come to pass, saith God, I will pour out my, this is, he's quoting from Joel here. Verse 17, it starts, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men which shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. You might like to note there, Peter opens by saying that they were living in the last days. I will, it shall, where is it? shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out. So poor Peter is saying that it would happen in the last days and these were the last days. But they were not living in the last days. Sorry, we are not living, brethren and sisters, in the last days like them. The last days of the New Testament, just trying to correct something that uh, you often hear uh, said from the platform and in conversation that we're living in the last days. We're not. They were living in the last days. The New Testament refers to the days of the apostles as the last days. We are living in the latter days. And Dr. Thomas goes to considerable lengths to discuss this subject in, in some of the books that I've read. If, if you're interested, we can have a chat or I can direct you to them. We're living in the latter days, not the last days. The last days were back in the times of the apostles. So we read here how that they received the Holy Spirit gifts or the comforter, as the Lord referred to it in John chapter 14. And it was given to assist the, our brethren and sisters back then as they had to deal with the vicious attacks and trials that they would encounter as Christians, Jews become Christians, from their fellow Jews and fellow Gentiles, both in Judea and from abroad. And you only have to read about that in places like Philippians and First Thessalonians and, and Acts of the Apostles. I, I, I don't know about you, but I personally never realised until I carefully considered it, how dreadful, how dreadful it was for them. People would, would kill you. The Lord warned them, you're going to be put to death. You're going to be dragged before courts. You're going to be treated terribly and all falsely throughout the whole habitable world as it was then known. And that this period would last for 40 years, concluding in about AD 70. Just um, have a look here at Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. It's an interesting comment here. Colossians 1, verse 23. Paul says, Chapter 1, verse 23, if you continue in the faith, <coughs> grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which, note this, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, <coughs> am made a minister. Now, that's not referring to our times. He's talking to the Lord's, deposit, the, 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 the Lord's apostles. Back then, the period about from AD 34, <coughs> pardon me, till about AD 65 or AD 70. They had preached the gospel for the whole habitable, habitable nations of the then known world to them. Well, now we want to come to the prophet Joel because the Lord directed us to... <coughs> Search the scriptures in the law of Moses and in the prophets for those things concerning himself. So we come to Joel, just going to go to one section, just chapter two. For the benefit of the sisters, I know some sisters do not like brethren talking all the time about war, as if they have a, a lust for it in some way. We're going to be considering something that's lovely, something that's uplifting, an uplifting message. And um, where are we going to go? Chapter 2, um, 
we'll just consider a few verses in chapter two. I'm not going to actually read a slab of that, as it were. Just to give you a bit of a background to Joel, it's going to be extremely brief, extremely brief. The book of Joel was written when Babylon was beginning to invade Judah in about 600 BC. That's the general thing. That was the time, Babylon. But Joel's description, like many of the prophets, can start on one subject and then project you to another period of history. And usually it's the kingdom age. They take something that was happened then and then give you a view into the future of the kingdom age, which is a lovely thing for our God to do. So within Joel's message, there is also a vision of the future invasion by the Russian Gog and his confederacy of nations that we believe will now start to coalesce in the years to come. We have to wait and see. But this is the time when Gog and that confederacy, confederacy of nations that we read of in Ezekiel 38 will come against Israel. Now, from chapter 2, verses 20 to verse 27, it describes that time or the time after that when Gog has been destroyed and Israel has been restored to prosperity and to spirituality. Okay? A very positive section. Just a couple of verses, verse 20. But I shall remove from off you the northern army. Now he's, he's gone now from Babylon to Gog and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the east sea and his hinder part towards the uttermost sea and his stink shall come up. Anyone think? of a parallel to where that stink is mentioned? Ezekiel 39? 39. Thanks, Dan. I wasn't sure. It mentions it there, a stink of Gog and his army as they clean up that body and that debris and that mess for, I think it's seven months. Verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for Yahweh will do great things. And be not afraid ye beasts of the field, and so on. Verse 26 to 27. And ye shall eat in plenty, and will be satisfied, and praise the name of Yahweh your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. These things, brothers and sisters, are most definitely going to be fulfilled. We have every reason to believe they will. Verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, verse 28 to 32 are a bit tricky. If you've had a careful look at what Peter says in Acts 2 and compare it with what God says here in Joel 2 verses 28 uh, and to 32, there's a bit of a difference. We might say Peter's been a bit naughty by changing scripture, but he hasn't. He hasn't done anything wrong. Verse 28 is quoted by Peter to describe the Holy Spirit gifts of AD 33, which was predicted by the prophet Joel. But a closer examination shows that the reference to the Holy Spirit being poured out in Joel is referring to the kingdom of God, the time of the kingdom after Gog has been destroyed. Okay? But Peter's quoted this to refer to the Pentecost in AD 33. But when you look carefully at these verses that he quoted, it's referring to the future when the Holy Spirit will be poured out in the kingdom age after Gog has been destroyed. This proof of that is verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. After what? After verse 20, after the northern army has been destroyed. And then verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered for a Mount Zion and Jerusalem will be deliverance. But there was never any deliverance in Jerusalem 
to, from the onslaught from Babylon in BC 600, nor in AD 70 when the Roman legions had decimated it. And nobody has ever, of, that, of that generation has never called upon Yahweh. And not only then, in verse 23, something there yields even deeper things from the message of the prophets. Verse 23, just make a point here, brothers and sisters, when we study any section of scripture, so often we can just read the surface message and say, oh, so I understand it. But there are deeper things here to be understood. And I'm not saying I'm very smart. I learned this from The Faith in the Last Day by Brother Thomas, as I, I remembered it years ago, and he does an exposition of verse 23. And it says, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain in the latter day in the first month. Um, Brother Thomas interprets this as follows. And I'm sure you've heard about this, but I'll just read it slowly. You can follow it through on at verse 23 and you might make might, might want to make some changes as you go this is how he translates it and this is incredible it's all about the holy spirit gifts being poured out at pentecost in ad 33 and when christ comes a second time after gog has been destroyed two pourings out of the holy spirit of course the latter pouring out brothers and sisters of the holy spirit is going to be enormous it won't compare to the moderate pouring out that took place in AD 33. This is his translation, okay? For he hath given you the teacher of righteousness, we know who that is, and he shall cause to descend for you a rain, the Holy Spirit, AD 33, a teacher and a latter rain, it's the kingdom age, in the first month. Notice it says there in the first month. When was Pentecost? What month? It's the third month. This is saying it's the first month. So what then is the significance of this latter rain of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit when our Lord comes, if it was in the first month? Well, what do we know about the first month? in scripture the first month was the time of the passover the month of abib now we've seen two examples one from the law and one from the prophets how they were fulfilled in the life of the lord jesus christ and now we see how that this latter day rain or pouring out of the holy spirit will occur when our teacher, as Brother Thomas translates it, and our saviour has returned. But do you know that the Lord's work at Passover all those years ago, predicted in Leviticus 23 and Exodus 12, performed by the Lord Jesus Christ in AD 33, did you know the Lord's work at Passover is still not fulfilled by him? While he won deliverance from sin and death for himself at his Passover, he will not rest till his brethren and sisters are likewise restored to life and life abundantly. And we'll see this in our final quotation in Luke chapter 22 and verse 14. It shows how carefully God, through his son, will fulfill all things. Luke chapter 22 and verses 14 to 18. We're just going to read it and we'll finish. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled 
in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Thank you, um, Brother John, for bringing your minds central to the sacrifice of Christ this morning and the work of God in bringing about the sacrifice of his son and the life and the hope which he gives towards us. <clears throat> we will read, not from Luke 22, but we will read from 1 Corinthians 11. And from verse 23. But the apostle says that he received of the Lord that which he also had received. And he now that, sorry, he, he received of the Lord, which he is now going to deliver to them. And that is that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had, he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is, do this in remembrance of me. Of the same manner, also he took the, the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But on that basis, we examine ourselves and we eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among us, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves or examine ourselves we would not be judged but when we are examined we are just we are just just chastened of the lord that we should not be condemned with the world now give thanks for the wine sorry the bread on the table before us We come before the loving Father with thanksgiving and praise to thy holy name, Yahweh, for the many mercies which thou, in the greatness of thy love, has manifested in the raising from the dead to honour and immortality, Jesus, thine anointed one, whose name we now celebrate in partaking of these memorials. The observance of these memorials, of which was instituted by him and which is received of us as part of his righteousness. We ask in humility for thy blessing on this bread, which we spiritually discern to be the body of thy dear son, which was broken for us, that we might take it, and as we take it, Loving Father, we, may we be continually reminded of the perfect law of obedience which was exhibited in his great sacrifice. May it be the means of 
fortifying ourselves by an acceptable observance until Jesus returns. And may we then be found worthy through thy mercy to sit down and take up with him in thy kingdom. Hear us then in our prayer, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now give thanks for the wine on the table before us. We desire to thank the loving Yahweh for this wine emblematic of the poured out life of thy dear son and our Lord. That life which was shed that we might have life more abundantly. We pray, loving Father, that thou would help us to realise the magnitude of this great sacrifice. This sacrifice which brought us out of that perpetual darkness and wherewith we are now surrounded by the glorious light of thy truth. This sacrifice which enabled us to become thy sons and daughters through faith. Help us, loving Yahweh, to realise that it is only through our trust in thee and through thy grace and mercy towards us that we might come unto thee, a way whereby we might, by continual, by continuance in well-doing, find favour in thy sight. Without this sacrifice, we know. Without this shedding of blood, we know that we would have been without hope in this world and of all men most miserable. Thou loving Yahweh and thy wisdom and thy power open up a way through faith whereby we can draw nigh to thee and by observing thy will, reach forward to that crown of righteousness that will be given to all those who love and serve thee. 
We ask our blessing in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen. Our memorial hymn this morning, brothers and sisters, is 256.
Brother Neil, brethren and sisters, good afternoon. Following are the ecclesial announcements for the forthcoming week, God willing. After the memorial meeting today, glass washing, our sisters Dawn Walney and Maureen Hunter. No, no uh, events tonight due to the uh, public uh, long weekend. On Sunday next week, uh, the 13th of March at 6 p.m., the Chinese English seminar plus the first principal class will be held. The first principal class, the uh, subject is true fellowship, the importance of ecclesial of ecclesias, and will be led by Brother Ben Derricky. I have this uh, note regarding that. Next Sunday evening, we are commencing a new series of studies aimed at our older young people and anyone who wishes to come along. The idea is to have a series of fundamental Bible studies using only a small number of quotes to explain a particular point. It would be useful if the young people were to bring a note or, a, or material so that they can do some Bible marking as well. Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. in this hall and also streamed via Zoom only is the information night on the code of conduct. Uh, Brother Greg will um, uh, be here to, uh, to uh, take us through the uh, Code of Conduct uh, document. Chairman will be myself. Uh, and once again, I have this note with regard to that. The Code of Conduct is designed to clearly establish what the Ecclesia understands and agrees are God's expectation, expectations of our behaviour expressed in the Bible and is therefore a very encouraging and positive, positive document to read. Like our child protection policy, we would like to discuss and improve this document with your help and adopt these policies at our annual general meeting in May, God willing. So please, if you have time and if you can, to be here on Wednesday evening to go through this code of conduct policy. Now, uh, as most of you know, next Saturday was to be the start of our special effort led by our brother Darren Taporis. But due to the COVID, due to COVID, this has been postponed until March next year, God willing. We are grateful, though, that Brother Darren has agreed to exhort us via Zoom for the next two Sundays. So next Sunday, the uh, Sunday school will commence at 9:20 a.m. At 11 a.m., the memorial meeting will be led by Brother Darren Taporis via Zoom. We will also need some volunteer, volunteers to do the roles of chairman, to read and to play the organ. So if you have, if you're able to help in that way, please contact our brother Simon if you can. Finally, we uh, ask that those uh, visitors, if you can take back with them the, uh, the loving fraternal greetings of the brethren and sisters at Gosnells as you, as you return to your respective ecclesias. Uh, one more item. Uh, as if you have been rostered to hall cleaning and set up, can you please refer back to the plan when setting up the hall? The plan is on the uh, fridge at the back there, uh, on the side of the fridge. So please follow those the plan so that when you set up the hall, so that uh, we've uh, set it up in the in the correct manner. Finally, the collection for this week is the ecclesial fund in the brown bag and the additional fund a collection for Heritage College is in the blue bag.
final hymn this morning, brethren and sisters, is hymn number 402. To whom all things are known and through whom all things exist. Blessed be thy holy name. In humility of approach we bear before thee, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And we seek that peace and consolation which only thou can provide. Help us. Loving Father, to hold fast the confidence of our hope, allowing thee, the only faithful and true God, to diligently instruct us in the paths of thy righteousness. May we seek to grow in grace and mercy ourselves through the knowledge and comfort of thy holy word until we can attain to that perfect stature in Christ Jesus. Please, loving Father, guide us into all truth and to an acceptable doing of thy will, and that our faith might be strengthened and our hope and reliance in thee renewed. Our thoughts ascend in fervent love and gratitude to thee, loving Yahweh, that we a feeble and a little flock surrounded by spiritual darkness are privileged to know thy truth as it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray, loving Father, for the peace of Jerusalem. When that time of mankind's trouble will be over and all wars and trouble will cease. Yahweh, help us and guide us through that hour of our trial as well, as we learn to look to thee alone as our strength and our shield and our defence and our personal troubles may soon pass, but not our will, loving Father, but thine be done. We thank thee and we praise thee, knowing that thou art in control of all things, including our very breath. And we offer our gratitude to thee through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Oh, I know this. I just saw it. Yeah, so I think we just saw that quite a lot, but I did. It's one of the only times I've read this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, that's 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 it.